All right, we're now recording. So while I'm setting up, I'm done with the chapter. So for today's lecture, I'm gonna sneak in a little bit of the next um, section, except I'm having trouble with this document camera, unfortunately. So it might be one of those situations, unfortunately. Okay. You can think of problems that you want me to do, but it's not going to work if I can't get the shared screen going. This might, so bear with me, this might have to be one of those days where I have to log off and log back on if I can't get it to go. So we're going to spend a few minutes to try to get that going. And looks like I got it. Okay. So we're good. All right. So we're here. The original schedule was going to be 3.11 today, tomorrow, questions and answers. I'm actually finished with the entire chapter. So I'm going to sneak in some of 4.1, but I'm going to let you have some time for questions and answers for the test for today, if you have any. And same thing for tomorrow. And then our test, of course, is Friday. <clears throat> To remind you, you turn all of this in for homework. On Friday, you there's a 70% rule, but that's really you know, easy to do considering I do a huge percentage of the homework problems anyway, right? But you have to turn in that as a minimum and it's due half an hour after the exam ends. So exam ends at 10. So you have to turn in the test by 10.05 and the homework by 10.30. But I'll accept the homework early, which is, Early is defined as any time after class is over on Thursday. So once class is over on Thursday, I'll take the homework. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna sneak in a little bit of 4.1. You can go ahead and take notes, but look at it kind of half-heartedly. Don't look at it that carefully because you, know, you don't wanna take your focus off of the chapter three exam. <clears throat> okay. And please note, uh, Prasanna sent something out, I believe, if you wanna look at what Prasanna had in preparation for the exam. You know, that can also be something you can use. Okay, but let me give you some introduction of 4.1. Uh, believe me, it will help out um, for when we get there, which is after the spring break. Okay, all right, so the exam is uh, regular time on Friday. That's all we're gonna do Friday. So Friday, I, I won't call the row. I'll take attendance, but not by calling the row. Uh, I'll just look at everyone's name. I got plenty of time to take row. Again, think of the principle of equivalence. If we were meeting face-to-face, -face, I wouldn't call the row on exam days. I can just look and see who's there. I got plenty of time to do that, right? <clears throat> okay, so uh, around 9.02, 9.03, 9.04, something like that, I'll send the exam on Friday by, by Canvas announcements. <clears throat> and then you log on, have your camera on with the true background. And if you have any questions, uh, put it in the chat, but otherwise keep yourself um, muted for the entire time. Okay. And uh, what else do I need to say? So how do I study? Study everything here. Okay. Again, Prasanna gave a practice test. You can look at it or not. It's, you know, up to you. Okay. And about 10 questions or maybe 11 because there's 11 sections that we have here. Okay. So if you have any other general questions about the test, let me know. It's been a long time since we've had a test but um, they all pretty much are the same style, okay? You get to have one cheat sheet, so if you haven't already done, so put together a formula sheet, go back and put all the formulas. I gave you lots of suggestions for what to put on the formula sheet, right? So you get to use a calculator and your cheat sheet, your formula sheet, but after that, no books, no notes, no calculators, no, uh, you can have it as a calculator, sorry, but no people, no internet, no uh, computers, no cell phones and other aids to help you, okay? So I will sneak in some of chapter four. Then after a while, I'll stop and let you ask questions in preparation for the test. But if there aren't any, I'll just keep going with chapter four. <clears throat> okay, so chapter four is applications of differentiation. There's gonna be a lot of graphing in this chapter, okay, graph. So, Page 276, maximum and minimum values. Okay. 
So I've talked about it just a little bit. You look at figure one, page 276. This looks like a maximum value. This looks like a minimum value, okay? Absolute maximum, absolute minimum. This is a very formal definition. It's correct, but I don't think you need it. It's whatever is the highest point. The highest function value is the absolute maximum. The lowest function value is the absolute minimum. So it looks like uh, three comma five is the absolute maximum and six comma two is the absolute minimum for this particular graph. All right, so absolute max, absolute min, okay? It's too much writing, so I just use the first three letters. So for absolute, I would normally just write ABS. Max, I, like I said, I'll just put MAX, min, M-I-N. <clears throat> so instead of writing maximum, M-A-X-I-M-U-M, -M, I'll just put max. Minimum, I'll normally just put min. Local maximum or minimum, sometimes relative maximum or minimum, they're both used. Okay, I prefer the term relative. <clears throat> so local, I'll use L-O-C. Relative, R-E-L. <clears throat> okay, just within a small neighborhood, it's the largest or smallest value around. So right here is a local maximum. If I just take the small neighborhood of that region in blue, it's the highest. Now, there are other points in the graph that are higher, but locally, relatively speaking, in a small neighborhood, it's a maximum, okay? Likewise, this would be a local minimum or relative minimum. In a relatively small region, like in the blue region here, it's the smallest point. Oh, there may be smaller points in the entire graph, but just locally in a small neighborhood, it's the lowest. <clears throat> this one here, this thing is a local and an absolute minimum, okay? So for the entire graph, it's the lowest but also locally, it's the lowest point. And that kind of makes sense, okay? And by the way, absolute, I won't use this notation, but sometimes you see global, okay, global maximum, global minimum, as in worldwide, kind of. And again, that kind of makes sense, okay? Think of uh, sporting events like the Olympics, okay? So supposedly, you know, if you win some event, then, uh, uh, let's say you run the, I don't know, 100 meter dash or whatever, and you win, okay? And when you get that medal, you're considered the fastest in the world, right? So if you're fastest in the world, you're also the fastest on your block, as it were, but it's not the other way around. You could be the fastest on your block, but that doesn't mean you're the fastest in the world, right? So if you have an absolute minimum, then you automatically have a local minimum. And likewise, if you have an absolute maximum, you automatically have a local Maximum. So this is absolutely the highest point on the graph worldwide, so to speak, is the highest. So if, it, if you look at it locally also, just in a small region, then of course you should also be the highest, right? If you're the fastest runner in the world, you should be the fastest on your block, right? But not the other way around. You might be the fastest in your block, but it doesn't mean that you're fastest in the world. So globally, right? So it's one direction. So we have absolute maximum and minimum. I'll use the first three letters, A, B, S. Okay. I will very rarely say global, but it's there. It just lets you know that sometimes the word global is used. And I'll type or write M-A-X or M-I-N. Okay. Local, L-O-C. I'll also say relative. Relative means the same thing. Relative, max, relative. I'll use R-E-L. Okay. So R-E-L-A-T-I-V-E -E for relative, maximum, minimum. Okay, and again, let me raise it up so you can see a little bit better. Yes. All right, so let's take a look at this graph. Looks to me like that's absolute maximum, absolute minimum. <laughs> okay, local minimum, local maximum, local minimum, local maximum, local minimum, local maximum. Right? Okay. I will differ from the text perhaps on these endpoints. I am gonna call this a local maximum. I am gonna call this a local minimum even though it's only one-sided, okay? <clears throat> I mean, that kind of goes along with, if you happen to live in a cul-de-sac, right? In a one-way, sorry, a street that is only on one side, right? You can't go any farther. 
you would still call that a high point, right? Even if there's no other homes on the other side, it's the highest around. So that's a local maximum. Likewise, if your home is like this, you're at the bottom of a hill and there's nothing else after that, you would still call that bottom. So I disagree with the text on this. I'm gonna call this a local minimum and a local maximum, even though it's only on one side. Okay, and notice once I say an absolute maximum, it's automatically a relative maximum also. Okay, and once I say absolute minimum, that automatically makes it a local minimum or a relative minimum too. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at such points here. That looks like a maximum, right? What seems to be the slope right up there? Zero. How about the slope right there? Zero. How about the slope here? That's undefined, right? We don't have any one slope. If I come from the left side, it looks like it's negative something. If I come from the right side, it looks like it's positive something. So I don't have a two sided derivative. Okay, and these are endpoints. So we're not worried about derivatives there. Okay. Page 277. And let me check the chat real quickly. Okay. And yeah. Okay, so Prasanna put something in the chat. So thank you, Prasanna. If anybody wants to look at the chat quickly about a review session from Prasanna, you can look at that. All right, this looks like the cosine function. We know it's periodic. Okay, we know maximum, absolute maximum, and also local max, absolute minimum, and local minimum. So you could have a tie, just like in real sporting events, you could have a tie for first place, right? So these are tied for absolute max. In fact, there's infinitely many of them. We know there's one here, there's another one here, and another one here, another one here, another one here. And these are both local and absolute minimum values, but there's another one here and another one here, right? And right here, what's the slope? Zero, 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 zero. <clears throat> so if the derivative is zero, horizontal tangent, that gives you a candidate for a maximum or minimum point, right? It's potentially a max or a min. <laughs> so this one, y equals x squared, okay, parabola. We have a minimum at the origin, zero, zero, and there's no maximum. So a maximum or minimum doesn't have to exist, right? This clearly has no maximum, it just goes up, 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 up on both sides, but there is a minimum. Okay. <clears throat> y equals x cubed, here's an example where the derivative is zero, but you have neither a maximum nor a minimum. At the origin, the slope is zero. Okay, how do I know that? Well, what's the derivative of x cubed? Three x squared. Plug in zero, you get zero. Slope is zero, but you can tell it's neither a maximum nor a minimum, okay? It's not a maximum because you can keep going up nearby. It's not a minimum because you can keep going down also. Okay, so just because the derivative is zero doesn't necessarily mean that you have a maximum or minimum, but you have a candidate, as it were. It's a possibility. Okay. All right, let's look here, bottom of 277. Here's a polynomial on a closed interval from negative one to four. Okay, so they plugged in some stuff. Negative one, if you plug it in, you get 37. And if you plug in some other points, you know, here they all are. Okay, and I'm not sure what that point is, but you can plug in four. Uh, I don't feel like it. You can see how bad it is, <clears throat> but it's four comma something. Okay, so that looks like absolute maximum, absolute minimum, local minimum, origin, local maximum, local minimum, local maximum, local maximum, right? Or again, relative maximum. So I'll say relative also. So relative max and absolute max. Remember, if you have an absolute max or min, it's automatically a local max or min. If you already have something 
worldwide, then it's correct within the block in a small region, right? So local and absolute max, relative min, relative max, relative min, and also absolute min, and a relative max. Okay. Notice derivative is zero, derivative is zero, derivative is zero. The derivatives here are not zero, but they might be maximum or minimum points just because they're endpoints. Okay. That is something that we'll have to check a little bit later. Okay. Page 278, something called the extreme value theorem. Okay. It might be useful to put this on your next cheat sheet. I don't think you should have to worry about it now since you have a test coming up on Friday. <clears throat> but what does this mean? If F is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, it's gotta be a closed interval. Closed interval from A to B, that means you count A, count B, and F is continuous. Then F attains an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum somewhere between A and B. Okay? If you have a continuous function on a closed interval, you must obtain an absolute max and absolute min. So in this picture, it's continuous, right? So the point C and D, that looks like absolute max, absolute min, okay? Absolute max, absolute min. In this case, it looks like there's a tie. You can have ties for absolute max or min. So absolute max, there's a tie right here. And that looks like uh, absolute min. Okay, and I'll just raise that up for focusing purposes. Where am I on page 278 for those of you that have the text? Okay, they're trying to show you in figures nine and 10 why you have to have a continuous function on a closed interval. Okay, here you do not have a continuous function, so there is no absolute maximum. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. But see that open circle there at one comma three? Okay, it's not continuous. So right here, there is no one number that's the highest. You can't say three because there's an open circle there. Okay, so I can't say the maximum is 2.9 because I could say 2.99, but that's not the maximum because I could say 2.999, but that's not the maximum because I could say 2.99999 and keep adding nines. So there's no one number that's the maximum. There is a minimum, looks like the minimum value is zero. Okay, so if I have a discontinuous function, the absolute max and min may or may not occur. <clears throat> and then in this picture, they're showing you what happens if you do not have a closed interval, right? If you have a half open interval, if you're going including zero, well, I guess they don't include zero. Yeah, it's parenthesis zero comma two, on an open interval, you could shoot up to infinity, which means there's no absolute max. And in this particular case, it looks like there's no absolute min either. There's an open circle at zero, one. So again, there's no one, but one number you can call the smallest. You can't say one because one's not in the, in the range. And you can't say 1.1 is there, but then you can say 1.01, but there's another smaller number, 1.001, but there's another smaller number, 1.001. So this has no absolute maximum or minimum. So it has to be on a closed interval, so-called extreme value theorem. Okay. Okay, then on page 279, you have something called Fermat's theorem. I don't think it's that important to write this one down, but you'll be doing some problems after the spring break that involve this quite a bit, actually. It says if F has a local maximum or minimum at C and the derivative exists, F prime exists, then F prime has to equal zero, okay? So if you have a max or min, you already know you have a maximum or minimum, like here or here or here. The derivative exists, you can draw a tangent line, then it has to be zero, okay? So that's not violated here because right here it's a minimum, but the derivative doesn't exist, right? If the derivative exists, it has to equal zero. So like there, or there, or there. So that's something called Fermat's theorem. Okay, we're gonna be using that theme quite a bit when we're trying to find maximum and minimum values. Okay, something called Fermat's theorem. Okay, definition on page 280. Critical number. You can put this on your cheat sheet 
Okay, again, if you want to wait until after the spring break, you know, that's okay. <laughs> a critical number of a function is a number in the domain of F such that the derivative is either zero or does not exist. Okay. For a lot of the homework problems, it's pretty much derivatives equal to zero. Very few problems will the derivative not exist, but there's some, they give you a few of those. Okay. So if the derivative does not exist or the derivative is zero, that's called a critical number. Now, why do we care about such things? Because they give me potentially maximum and minimum values. Okay, as we saw back here. Let's look at max and min. Derivative is zero, doesn't exist. Derivative is zero, derivative is zero. Okay. And the endpoints, technically the two-sided derivative doesn't exist, right? There's only a derivative on one side, but not on both sides. Okay. So critical number, it's in the domain, okay, but the derivative is either zero or does not exist. Why do I want such a list? because that might give me possibly a maximum or minimum value on the graph, okay? So that's what's going on there. Okay, and number seven, if F has a local maximum or minimum at C, then C is a critical number of F. So that's what we want, these critical numbers. Okay. They might lead to potential maxima and minima for our function. Okay. All right. Uh, there's something called a closed interval method. I'm not really going to talk about it now. I'll talk about it when we get to it. It's correct. It's questionable whether you really want to put that stuff on your next cheat sheet. There's a lot there. Okay. I'd rather that you understand the process. Okay. <clears throat> and in case you're wondering, um, if we were meeting, you know, if we were meeting face to face, you wouldn't get to write any of this down. You'd have to memorize it all, right? Okay, so that is what I have there. Okay, so that's all I have for introduction. Okay, and the rest of today, if you have questions, I'll start doing some problems in preparation for the test. I do see quite a few from an individual. So if you want me to do some problems right now for preparation for the test, I can do that. Looks like uh, there's enough there to keep me going for the rest of today. All right. All right, so let me write some of this down. Uh, 3.1, 21, 27, 3.2, 11, and 19, 3.3. If I don't get all, all this uh, today, we can do it tomorrow, of course. 3.4, 35, 37, 3.5, 25, and 31, 3.6, 21, and 23, 3.8, 11, 3.9, 27, 3.11, 13, 3.2, 11, I've already gotten that. 3.4, 43, 3.3, 11, 19, 31, 3.5, 5, 17, 3.4, 17, 33, and 43, 3.5, 7, 13, 21, 3.9, 23. Okay, and I'm not sure I can get to all of these, obviously, so I'll just get started. It's probably the best thing to do, 3.10, 25, 3.85, 3.6, 19. So if I don't get to your problem today, you know, ask again tomorrow, all right? So I need to make the chat disappear. And chances are I'm not gonna get to any others today. So um, I think I've got a good assortment here of what to do. All right, so I guess I'll go section by section to make it easier on me. So I got a request from 3.127. Okay, 3.127. Okay, by the way, now that we, we have the whole range of the chapter, you can use any method that you wish 
to do these. So 3.127, uh, the chain rule had not been introduced yet, but now that we know the chain rule, you might as well just go ahead and use the chain rule. G of Q equals one plus Q to the negative one squared. Okay. So now that we know the chain rule, two times one plus Q to the negative one times the derivative of the inside, which is negative Q to the negative two. And the problem started off with a negative exponent. So I can leave it as a negative exponent. Maybe I'll just put negative two, one plus Q to negative one, Q to negative two. And that's that. Okay. 3.127, we got 21. 3.121, h of u is a u squared a u cubed plus b u squared plus c u. All right, a, b, and c are considered constants. So h prime of u is three times a u squared plus two b u plus c. Okay, and that's all there is to it. Okay, let's see, 3.211. And because of the, the volume of problems that I have, I'm really aiming for quantity more than quality. I'll just get it down, you can look at it later. 3.2 number 11. f of y is one over y squared, can't see, minus three over y to the fourth, y plus five y cubed. Okay, you can avoid the product rule if you just distribute it, foil it out first, outer, inner, last, so that times that is y to the negative one. That times that is five y. That times that is negative three y to the negative third. That times that is 15 y to the negative one. Okay, double check that that, I think we're good. Okay, so whenever you see ways to make the derivative easier, then you should do it. Okay, so the derivative is negative y to negative two plus five plus nine y to negative fourth minus 15 y to negative two. I'm gonna say et cetera. Et cetera means put all the negative exponents in a denominator. You can do that, but to save time, I'm just gonna go ahead. Okay, 3.219. S minus radical S over S squared. Again, you can make the problem much easier by just dividing. S divided by S squared is S to the negative one. S to the one half divided by S squared is S to the negative three halves. Okay, so Y prime is negative S to negative two plus three halves S to the negative five halves and again, I'll say et cetera. The only et cetera is put the negative exponents into the denominator. But again, to save time, I'll just keep going. Okay, 3.3, number 11. And same thing for tomorrow. So your homework, quote unquote, for tomorrow is to come up with any questions that you still might have for chapter three. Otherwise I will threaten, quote unquote, to keep going with chapter four, but I don't have to. Okay, 3.311, f of theta is sine theta over one plus cosine theta. So looks like the quotient rule, <coughs> bottom times the derivative of the top, derivative of the sine is cosine, minus the other way around, top times the derivative of the bottom, which is negative sine theta all over one plus cosine theta 
squared. Let's actually clean this one up a little bit. I do have a double negative. Two negatives make a positive. So I have cosine theta plus cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta over one plus cosine theta quantity squared. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So cosine theta plus one over one plus cosine theta squared. This is the same as this. Cosine theta plus one, one plus cosine theta, they are the same. So you can cancel one of these with one of these. So best final answer is one over one plus cosine of theta. And yeah, let me raise it up again for focusing purposes. In case you couldn't read what I wrote down at table level, so to speak. Okay, so that's that. Uh, 19, prove the root of the cotangent is negative cosecant squared. Okay, so 19, derivative of cotangent x dx is cosine x over sine x prime. Okay, so bottom times derivative of the top, which is negative sine x minus the top times derivative of the bottom, which is cosine x over the square of the bottom, sine squared x. So on top, I have negative sine squared x minus cosine squared x over sine squared x. Okay, this is equal to negative one. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So negative sine squared x minus cosine squared x. That's like negative parentheses sine squared plus cosine squared. Okay, so it's negative one over sine squared x. And the reciprocal of the sine is the cosecant, so negative cosecant squared x. So that's a proof of the derivative of the cotangent, right? 31. Okay, tan x minus one over secant x, use the quotient rule. So, okay, so bottom times the root of the top, secant squared minus the top times the root of the bottom, all over the square of the bottom. Okay, so that's gonna require some cleaning up. Um, let's see. I can cancel secant squared here, right? I can cancel, well, one of these secants. So minus, I don't wanna mix you up too much. 10 X minus one, 10 X over secant X. Okay, when I divide over here, secant squared cancels out, so I have secant X. Here, one of these secants cancels that, so, but I still have one left over in the bottom, and I still have that. Okay, so secant x minus tangent squared x minus a minus, so plus tan x over, oops, this is separate, secant x. All right, maybe I can keep going. Um, yeah, let's multiply top and bottom by secant x. Because I can see what's going to happen. So I, have, so I have secant squared x minus tangent squared x plus tangent x over secant x. Remember anything from trig about that one? That's one. So one plus tangent x over secant x. Okay, that's part A. Part B, simplify 
by writing in terms of sine and cosine. Okay, so part B, tangent is sine over cosine. Secant is one over cosine. Okay, multiply top and bottom by cosine. So these are gone. So that gives me sine x minus cosine x. So f prime of x is simply cosine x plus sine x. <clears throat> so can I make these the same? Can I make that look like sine x over cosine x? Well, let's keep going here. One plus sine x over cosine x divided by one over cosine x, multiply top and bottom by cosine x, and we do get the same thing, cancel, cancel. So cosine x plus sine x, and that is exactly what we had over here. Okay, and yeah, let me raise it up again so you can see that a little bit better. I think I already showed you that, let's look at this. that and that okay so that is that i think i'm up to 3.4 now what time is it uh, 10 minutes left roughly okay let me check the chat uh, also all right got that 3.1113 see that 3.1025 Okay, got that. All right. 3.435. 3 3.435. Y equals cosine of a mess. So you know, at the beginning, you're gonna go negative sine of the mess, even before I write it, right? Negative sine of the mess, and then times the derivative of the mess, which will be a quotient. So what is it? One minus e to the two x, one plus e to the two x. All right, so y prime is negative the sine of one minus e to the two x over one plus e to the two x, times the derivative of the inside which is a big thing. So bottom times derivative of the top, derivative of e, negative e to the two x is negative e to the two x times two, minus the top times derivative of the bottom, e to the two x times two, all over one plus e to the two x quantity squared. You could go on and clean this up more, but I'm not gonna do it now, okay? And by the way, on the exam, if you ever get something and you're not sure should you keep going, then you know you can always ask me. Sorry, there should be parentheses here. Parentheses right there. I think you get some cancellation here, if I'm not mistaken, and some combining. Okay, but that's quote unquote just algebra. Okay, 37. Cotangent squared of sine theta. Okay, so the outermost function is a squaring function. So two cotangent sine of theta to the first power, two minus one is one. Okay, so I'm done with that. Times the derivative of the inside function, derivative of cotangent of sine theta is negative cosecant squared sine theta times the derivative of the inside function sine of theta, which is cosine theta. By the way, you might argue, well, can't you keep going and take the derivative of the inside? Yeah, but what's the derivative of theta? One, so you don't have to keep going. And that's that. Okay, let's see, where are we now? 43. Two R A to the R X. Okay, 
plus n to the p. The only variable is x, it says so here. R is a constant, n is a constant, p is a constant. So the outer's most function is something to the p power. So p, 2r a to the rx plus n to the p minus one times the derivative of the inside with respect to x. So that would be zero. 2r is constant. So 2r a to the rx. The exponent is not e, it's a, which means I need to put on a natural log of a, you might recall. And then by the chain roots times the derivative of the exponent, which is another r, it looks like. Okay, so a quick timeout. Derivative a to the x is a to the x ln a, you might recall. Okay. Uh, 17, going backwards here, but that's how it was presented to me. 2x minus three to the fourth. X squared plus X plus one. Now I suspect a lot of you, the question might be, how do I get it to look like the back of the book? <clears throat> it's gonna be a lot of extra algebra which I'm normally not interested in now, okay? So once you do the product group for something like this, I would say stop, don't even keep going. Let me try to get the curl out here. Okay, so first times the derivative of second, five x squared plus x plus one to the fourth power. Then by the chain root times the derivative of the inside, two x plus one. And I'll scroll down plus the second, x squared plus x plus one to the fifth, times the derivative of the first, four, two x minus three cubed, times the derivative of the inside, which is two, okay? And I would say just leave it except maybe do four times two is eight, okay? So just change four times two to eight, but I would say stop, okay? If this disagrees with the back of the book, it actually doesn't. The back of the book, you can do some real heavy duty factoring like take out the two X minus three cube, take out X squared plus X plus one to the fourth power. You know, it's not really worth it in my opinion. So just leave it like that otherwise. Okay, 33. Four to the C over X. Which you should treat as necessary as four C to the X minus one. So the derivative is the same thing for to the C over X. And because the base is in E it's four, it's times natural log of four. And now by the chain root times the derivative of this, which is negative C X to the negative two. Okay, and just put the negative two downstairs. So this one I'll keep going as how about negative C ln four times four to the C over X divided by X squared. Yeah, we'll leave it like that. Okay, just a few minutes left. 3.5, how much do I wanna do there? The remaining time. So I, I won't get that much more done today, but you can ask questions tomorrow. B point five twenty five Y sine of two X X cosine two Y Find the equation and tangent at pi over two, pi over four. Y sine two X, X cosine two Y. Okay, <clears throat> product rule. 
first times the derivative of the second, derivative of sine of two x is cosine two x times two plus second function times the root of the first derivative of y is dy dx. Derivative of the right side, product root, first times the derivative of the second derivative of cosine of two y is negative sine two y times the derivative of two y, which is two dy dx plus second function cosine two y times the derivative of the first, which is just one. So that's that. Okay, you could solve for dy dx, but here it's a lot easier to just plug in. So every time I see pi over two, uh, every time I see x, put pi over two, every time I see y, put pi over four. So assuming I did this right, so this is a pi over four times two cosine of two x, two times pi over two is pi, plus sine of two times x, sine of pi, dy dx equals, let's see, x is pi over two times negative the sine of two y, so negative sine of pi over two dy dx plus cosine of two y, cosine of pi over two. Okay, let's see, sine of pi is zero, that's gone. Cosine of pi is negative one. So that makes this negative pi over two. Okay, sine of pi over two is one. So negative pi over two dy dx plus cosine of pi over two is zero. So I have negative pi over two equals negative pi over two dy dx. That means dy dx is one. Multiply both sides by negative two over pi. dy dx equals one. Okay, point slope. So y minus y one equals m times x minus x one. And that's all the time we have. So let me just do the focusing thing and then we're done for today. Okay, so sorry if I didn't get to your problems, um, bring them up tomorrow. So right after we take row tomorrow, I'll go straight to questions and answers and you can just fill up the chat with your questions. If it ever stops, I'll just go on and do more of the next chapter. So if you don't want me to do that, you just ask a lot of questions, okay? All right, that'll do it for today, folks. So have a good day and we'll see everybody tomorrow. All right, bye everybody.